so this is Dennis Parapalitza okay, from Colorado. And uh, he's on the other experiment. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so when we, when we started the heavy iron program, we were in a control room and there's a bunch of physicists looking around and saying, why aren't the events round? It's float. Well, what's happened to the calorimeters? The jets don't look right. Ah, oh, yeah, that's jet quenching. So we, we don't like, we're going to publish a great paper on jet quenching because Alice will never do it. And then these sneaky people from Atlas came and published. They didn't even ask our permission to publish about jet quenching, even though we had this paper. So, um, it's a great achievement. Um, Alice and Atlas have done wonderful physics since then. Um, Dennis is, uh, was an undergraduate and did his PhD in Columbia. Oh, was it called? Father, MIT. Uh, MIT, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Masters of Columbia. Yeah, Masters of Columbia. And then PhD in Columbia, and then um, went on to be a Gold Harbor fe Fellow at Brookhaven, and uh, is really doing a lot of new, different kind of physics at, um, at Atlas, and just showing the versatility of the heavy iron movement, which I think is a very nice strength and we're dancing to. So it's welcome us to you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. It's very kind. Uh, so, I, I use these buttons, da Daniel. To go okay. Uh, so, great. So, so um, I'm going to uh, uh, tell you about one particular aspect of uh, the kind of research that we do uh, in trying to understand the quark gluon plasma created in uh, relativistic heavy ion collisions. So, the um, the uh, 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 original scientific motivation for what we're trying to do is to understand the emergent phenomena uh, of the strong nuclear interaction. We think that we have the, com the correct and complete theory of the strong nuclear interaction. It's called quantum chromodynamics. We can write down uh, the Lagrangian for the interaction, for example, in a, in, a, in a pretty compact form as they have here. We think we know the particle content of this theory, the, the, the quarks and gluons that carry the color charge. Um, and even though, in principle, this is a, a complete description of the interaction, we think, um, there are many questions about how the strong nuclear interaction manifests itself in nature that are not obvious just by inspection of the Lagrangian. So some examples, uh, we don't fully understand how it is that quarks and gluons come to be confined inside hadrons. Uh, we don't have good a priori ways of calculating what are the masses of these bound states. We don't even fully know which particular uh, bound states uh, are allowed under the interaction in nature. And these are all questions about uh, QCD in, in the vacuum ground state uh, the question gets even more interesting if one starts to uh, ask how does the, the, the interaction behave under extreme conditions. Um, this is a plot uh, from a lattice QCD calculation which shows the energy density of, of nuclear material as a function of temperature. Uh, it's ordinary uh, hadronic uh, nuclear matter sort of uh, down here. And then one can see that as a function of temperature, right around uh, lambda QCD, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, there's a dramatic change in the energy density. Uh, and what's happening is that uh, the degrees of freedom are changing from being hadronic to partonic, in the sense that at sufficiently high energy density and temperature, the quarks and gluons, which are normally trapped inside of nuclei, uh, become liberated, become deconfined. And uh, the, the material that one forms uh, instead is, is something that behaves more like a plasma, something we call the quark gluon plasma, uh, which is a, a dense material filled with the bare color charged particles. So uh, this is a QCD in a regime that's quite different from the vacuum conditions that we are used to thinking about, uh, and it may manifest some rather different behavior. Uh, one of the um, analogies that I like to make is to uh, to the kinds of phenomena one sees in electronic plasmas, right? So if you take a lot of electronic material and you heat it up to a sufficiently high degree, uh, you, uh, where you separate the charges, uh, you form a plasma uh, uh, of uh, electronic matter where uh, there are bare electric charges. And uh, electronic plasmas exhibit a rich uh, set of phenomena that, again, are not obvious just from the inspection of, say, Maxwell's laws. Here's an example of uh, filamentation in a plasma globe. So the analogy that I like to make is, in a nuclear plasma, you, you, you may have um, uh, uh, this emergent many-body behavior, but uh, it's happening in a material where uh, the bare charges are SU3 color charges and not 
uh, electric charges. OK, so uh, how do we create these kinds of conditions where we can observe the quark lone plasma and its behavior? Um, this is done today at some of the large particle accelerators around the world. Uh, the one that I'm going to focus on mostly for my talk is the Large Hadron Collider. Many of you are familiar with it. Uh, 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 many people are familiar with it from, from the uh, high energy physics program that people usually think of associated with it. So here's an aerial snapshot of uh, of the LHC situated at CERN. Here's a view inside the tunnel. Uh, most of the physics program at the LHC is to collide protons, so small, sort of relatively uh, uh, well understood hadrons uh, to, for example, discover the Higgs particle or search for new physics and so forth. But out of a, uh, for about a month out of the year, the LHC is filled not with uh, protons, but with large nuclei, so fully stripped, fully ionized. Uh, lead nuclei, for example, we call them heavy ions, and they're uh, accelerated and brought into collision. Here's a, a cartoon of uh, what, uh, diagrammatically, what such a nucleus-nucleus collision might look like. So these nuclei are accelerated to, uh, 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 to uh, the TV scale, so many thousands of uh, 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 times energy above their rest mass to very nearly the speed of light, and they're brought into a head-on collision. Uh, what happens is that the energy density and the temperature in that collision zone where the nuclei pass through each other uh, for a short time becomes so large that we trigger this transition from the normal hadronic matter to a quark gluon plasma. So uh, every such uh, lead, lead collision, so here's an example where the two of them are sort of shearing uh, or a, a, a big volume um, of quark gluon plasma uh, out of each other. The quark lone plasma uh, then expands explosively as a fireball outward and fills uh, the detectors, and that's uh, how we study it. And um, the, uh, since we've, in the modern era of heavy ion collisions, um, one of the very big surprises about uh, how the QGP behaves, um, yeah, I'll do this. Um, is that uh, the, the, um, the system seems to behave as an almost uh, perfect fluid uh, in the sense that uh, it exhibits an almost totally frictionless flow. The way that the, the quark lone plasma, after it's created, evolves uh, is in a way that's, uh, that can be described by relativistic hydrodynamics. And more impressively, uh, it undergoes this evolution with the lowest shear viscosity to entropy density ratio of any material that we've created in the laboratory. Uh, and that includes, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, the strongly coupled cold atomic gases that you see on the end of the scale there. OK? So uh, in the next few slides, and unfortunately, I've rendered this into a PDF, so these animations are, are not going to play. Um, but what I was trying to do on this slide and the next one is uh, give you some visual intuition for what it means to have a very low viscosity. So you'll have to imagine in your mind uh, that this is, there, is, there is water falling on top here. And then this is something that's more like a, a honey or pitch. And uh, the idea is um, those liquids behave very differently as characterized by the very different viscosities. So, so uh, if you think of viscosity as the uh, uh, resistance to deformation in a flow, um, the water flows very readily, whereas something uh, uh, more viscous like honey, if, if a part of it is trying to flow downward, uh, the momentum of that part of the fluid is very easily sort of distributed everywhere else in the region. And so it flows much less readily. Uh, and on the next slide, I apologize again. And these, these didn't uh, come out in the, in the PDF we put together to, to present here. Um, there's a similar kind of phenomenon that happens uh, if you look at how um, a region of quark gluon plasma might evolve. So uh, what, what these are here, uh, these are uh, uh, 2 plus 1D hydrodynamic simulations that show you the energy density in the transverse plane after the collision. And basically, um, what happens is that uh, in the viscous case, all of these fine features and structures that you see in the initial state um, very efficiently get uh, uh, dulled away. And then the evolution of the system looks sort of very blobby uh, and spherical by the time that it's done. 
In the low viscosity case, um, and again, I apologize for the lack of a, uh, um, animation here. In the low viscosity case, what happens is that uh, the individual little pressure gradients uh, from different anisotropies in the initial state um, get preserved very readily by the hydrodynamic evolution. And so um, in the low viscosity case, one really sees sort of parts of the fluid continue to, continue to flow outward at all angles. So, um, so that's the situation with, with the, the quark gluon plasma. And we can really see this kind of behavior um, really in individual events. Here's an example of a, a nucleus, nucleus collision. So these, these two have just crossed each other this way. Uh, this is a collision where the two nuclei had some finite impact parameter. right? They're not exactly head on. And so the shape of the region they've sheared off has this uh, a, a particular almond shape, just from the intersection of, of two spheres. And what happens here is um, there's, a certain, there's a certain pressure in the middle uh, of, the, of the quark gluon plasma region. And the pressure is zero, far outside. And uh, because the region is much more compact along this direction, the pressure gradient is larger going from here out to the sides than it is up to down. So uh, in the hydrodynamic evolution, what this means is that uh, when this thing starts to flow, uh, that pressure gradient drives the particles that move this way to have a larger momentum compared to the ones that are moving uh, top to bottom. And so when we measure, for example, the distribution of particles in the final state after the quark gluon plasma has expanded and cooled off and turned back into hadrons, um, we see, it, we measure them above some, above some uh, a minimum momentum. We see uh, 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 this particular, um, in this case, uh, uh, second order modulation that's coming from particles being pushed out this way compared to that way. That, that, that's the signature of the low viscosity expansion of the quark gluon plasma. Um, and that's, so that's sort of a very interesting feature of it uh, uh, in and of itself. Um, but many people think it also uh, has uh, connections to people who study uh, the early universe cosmology. So actually, just after the Big Bang, all uh, 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 the matter um, that we see today uh, was in this same very high density, very high temperature regime, all of the matter was, was, a, was a quark gluon plasma, at least for the first few microseconds. And then just like the quark gluon plasma created in colliders, um, the universe expanded uh, and cooled and eventually formed uh, uh, into hadrons. So uh, the quark gluon plasma is the deconfined phase of QCD present in the early universe. Um, if you want to understand how the primordial uh, fluctuations that may have occurred in that very early time uh, may give rise to, um, to features in the final state of the universe, uh, one of the, the things that you can do is study uh, quark gluon plasma behavior. OK, so this is a material which, which, is, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, one thing that we can do is characterize how the quark gluon plasma behaves um, as a function of, of, of length scale. So uh, on the left-hand side here, the long distance behavior of the quark gluon plasma uh, is characterized by this strongly coupled uh, emergent uh, near perfect fluidity. So there's, there's some uh, seriously non-trivial collective many body behavior on the one end. On the other hand, this is a material uh, that we think we know the composition and fundamental interactions of exactly. We know that uh, uh, the quark gluon plasma, uh, uh, if you were to probe it at very short distance scales, uh, according to QCD, you should see that it's composed of uh, non-interacting quarks and gluons. And so somehow, uh, this material, we know exactly what it's made up of. And, and, and we think we have the correct theory of the interaction. Uh, but it exhibits this non-trivial many body behavior. So one of the uh, orienting questions in, in heavy ion physics, what I do, is to understand how this behavior emerges from the underlying QCD degrees of freedom. OK? OK. Um, 
So let me take a step back. We, uh, we observe this uh, collective behavior in one extreme at long distance scales. We have theoretical guidance about what the, what the, the composition uh, of this material is on the other extreme. What we'd like to do is uh, probe the, uh, the degrees of freedom in the middle. What we'd like to do is perform some kind of microscopy, right? If we were material scientists, uh, we, would, we would try to collect some QGP, some quark gluon plasma, in a vial, and we would probe it uh, with a broad spectrum of strongly interacting particles of quarks and gluons. And we would watch, uh, do, do, they, do they scatter off of some medium quasi-particle? Are they, are they absorbed and there's, there's some back reaction? Um, do they undergo induced radiation in the strong, due to the strong color fields? Do some of them pass through? Is, is there some, there's some transmission phenomena, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, in this case, we can't do this kind of controlled experiment. Um, nobody knows how to, how, to, how to trap a quark gluon plasma and keep it from, from uh, 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 cooling off and, and evaporating. Um, and we certainly don't know how to prepare some external beam of quarks and gluons that we can fire through it to see how it behaves. So the only ways that we have of probing the quark gluon plasma at these intermediate uh, length scales is through what we call internally generated probes. So using some probes um, that are created as part of the collision process itself. Um, and in particular, we do this with what's called jet production. So uh, even in a proton-proton collision, so you just have just simple PP collision where there's no quark gluon plasma created, um, you can have one of the partons, or a quark or a gluon, in, in uh, each of the protons, undergo what's called a hard scattering. So this is uh, a scattering where, um, where the end products come out with a large transverse momentum to the direction of the beams. The particles are kicked out at large angles. Um, and then those hard scattered partons, they begin to, to radiate, they can radiate gluons, they can split into quark anti quark pairs. Um, but in general, there's a, there's a parton shower that develops until the virtuality of this uh, initial hard scattered parton uh, 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 drops uh, down. Um, so, so what happens in jet production is um, there's a broad spectrum uh, shower of quarks and gluons, and then uh, by the end of the shower, typically the, the, the quarks and gluons turn into hadrons, um, they fly towards our detector, and we detect them as a collimated uh, jet, what's called a jet of particles, okay? So that's the internally generated probe that we're gonna try to use to understand the quark gluon plasma um, behavior. So, uh, so back to my picture here, so, uh, long length scale behavior there on the left, uh, short distance perturbative composition on the right, and we're gonna try to use uh, the fact that when jets are produced uh, in a quark gluon plasma, um, this, the, the parton shower development, all the, 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 the branching and the radiation, um, they're happening as the jet is traversing this expanding cooling quark gluon plasma, and so the idea is we're, we're probing the degrees of freedom of the medium uh, over a wide distribution of, of scales and also uh, 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 at different times. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, what's the, what are the experiments where we actually uh, uh, do these uh, kinds of measurements? So I'm a member of, um, as uh, uh, Michael told you, uh, the Atlas detector at the, at the LHC. Um, so here's a view of it uh, underground. Uh, inside the LHC tunnel. So for scale, here are a few scientists. You can see how tiny they are. Um, ATLAS is a modern, general purpose, uh, large acceptance, large rate, um, high energy <coughs> physics detector, which means that it's composed of specialized subsystems for measuring almost all of the different particles that can be produced in a collision, basically everything except uh, neutrinos. And uh, I want to show you what uh, uh, an event that creates uh, jets looks like. Here's a, a rendering of a real uh, data event. This is uh, a proton-proton collision event. 
Um, the protons are coming in from the left and the right sides of the screen here. And uh, basically, these yellow lines that you see here, these are charged particles that were produced in the interaction. Uh, the, the, the charged part, this is a reconstruction of the trajectories they took. They're, they're bending in a, in a central magnetic field and going through layers of silicon. Um, and then the yellow and the blue uh, 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 Lego stacked blocks, um, this represents energy deposited in the calorimeters. So measurements of, of, uh, 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 of strongly interacting and also electromagnetically interacting particles. So if you look at this event by eye, uh, you can tell pretty readily that uh, there was a back-to-back a -back, uh, pair of jets produced. So um, if I plop my, my little drawing over it, right, that's, that's, uh, that's the physics process that we're seeing. Yeah, that's what that looks like. So in proton-proton collisions, uh, uh, these jets are so obvious you can pick them out by eye. Uh, and in general, jets are, are a very widely used precision tool in, in almost all aspects of high energy physics. Okay. The problem is that um, in a heavy ion collision, uh, we have not only the particular nucleon-nucleon collision that produced the jets, uh, but we have all the other nucleons in each of the nuclei, right, which are, which are undergoing multiple interactions with one another. So in a heavy ion collision, when two lead nuclei collide, um, you have this phenomenon, but it's happening uh, atop of an enormous background of very, very many low PT particles that are produced by all the other collisions. So let me show you an example of that. So keep your eye on this. So here is a proton-proton uh, collision event. Yeah. And if I go forward, here's an example of a lead-on-lead -lead collision. You can see the entire event is completely lit up with energy. There's energy deposits going everywhere. Okay? And so in this environment, it's much more challenging to try to pick out uh, where the jets are, where the collimated bursts of particles um, are. So uh, you might see that, okay, this, there's, a, there's a sort of a localized <coughs> deposition of energy here. You know, maybe there's one here. But identifying them and, and also properly measuring their properties as experimentally uh, much more challenging in these kinds of environments. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we've learned a lot about how to make measurements like this. Um, Here is an example of uh, the kind of event that, that, uh, that um, uh, Michael was talking about. Um, when the LHC first started colliding heavy ions about uh, 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 just about nine years ago, um, people started seeing events that look a lot like this. So this is now a rendering of a data event, but now the beams are going into and out of the page. So what you're seeing is, is where the, the, uh, the momentum is flowing um, in the transverse plane. And this particular event, uh, you can see what looks like a jet. There's a collimated deposition of energy uh, that's going on up here. But if you uh, go to look for the balancing jet that you expect just from proton-proton collisions, there's not anything obvious happening here on the other side. So that was a very striking, um, a, a, a striking um, example that, uh, uh, that the jet production in lead-lead collisions is not going to look like what it looks like in PP collisions because of the interaction uh, of the jet with the QGP. So we think we understand why the events look the way they do. Um, it's due to a process uh, that we call jet quenching. So the idea here is perhaps this is an event where the hard scattering, where the particular nucleon-nucleon collision that produced the jets, um, maybe that was localized um, towards the edge, towards the surface of the quark and plasma region. And so one of the hard scattered partons flew this way and basically immediately escaped and proceeded to develop as if it was in vacuum. But the other hard scattered parton, it turned around and it saw uh, an entire length of very dense, very hot medium. And as it tried, as the parton shower tried to, to develop its way through, um, it became attenuated. It became partially thermalized in the quark lone plasma medium. The way that the shower developed was affected um, there is, there is uh, energy that, that, that should have remained collimated with that initial direction, which was instead transported 
to large angles. And in general, the, the, the angular momentum structure of the jet looks very distorted. So we call this uh, uh, jet quenching. And so this is uh, an explanation of why, uh, for example, there's no detectable jet on the other side. So this is interesting to look at individual events. Um, ultimately, one wants to have some broader, more systematic classification of these kinds of jet quenching phenomena when the jet is really uh, attenuated and stopped by the QGP. Um, so uh, we, can, we can imagine different kinds of measurements that we can make to characterize jet quenching. Um, one uh, example of a measurement I'll show you uh, is a very basic measurement of, of the transverse momentum spectrum of jets that emerge from the QGP. So the transverse in this case is, is transverse to the beam direction. And uh, the idea here is that uh, you measure uh, the, the momentum of the, part of, of the jets that make it out of the QGP, um, and you can take the ratio to what the spectrum should have been if there was no QGP formation at all, if you just had jet production in vacuum, not, not inside the dense medium, okay? So uh, we can make uh, this kind of a ratio, and it looks like this. So on the y-axis is the suppression factor, as I've defined it. On the x-axis, this is measured as a function of the jet transverse momentum. Uh, and what you see here is that uh, the suppression factor is, is far below one. It, it reaches sort of on the order of uh, a 0 0.4, 0 0.5 in the most extreme cases. And the different colors that you see plotted here, this is basically uh, our way of controlling for, for the overall degree of nuclear overlap. So we have nice um, uh, uh, data-driven sort of independent ways of, of, uh, of, of identifying on a collision by collision basis uh, uh, how far apart the centers of mass of the nuclei were. So we can pick out collisions where um, we had an almost completely head-on collision where the quark gluon plasma region was, was large uh, uh, and, and hot and long-lived. So uh, unsurprisingly, you get the biggest suppression factors in those. Um, but by selecting on collisions that had uh, less and less overlap, we can select events where the quark gluon plasma region is smaller and a little bit colder and, and shorter lived. And so unsurprisingly, you see that in those event categories, the, the, uh, the jet production spectrum in the lead-lead collisions looks systematically more and more like the proton-proton ones. Um, so uh, these measurements that I've been showing you, th these are measurements of basically um, uh, interpreting the jets that you're seeing as if they were um, uh, 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 lower energy jets uh, but coming from the vacuum. Uh, there is now a, a lot of effort and a lot of attention in trying to understand not only uh, how much energy is transferred out of that uh, collimated cone, uh, but in trying to understand the momentum structure uh, of the part of the parton shower that's still correlated with the initial direction. So I'm not going to go into detail into all of these, um, but I will just say that there's lots of ideas about how do you measure the correlation of the hadrons that are inside the jet cone. What, what can that tell you about um, the interaction of the jet with the medium? I'll just tell you about one. I'll tell you about uh, this one here which is the longitudinal momentum fraction or the fragmentation function. So um, this is a variable that uh, uh, asks uh, how is the total energy of the jet that we see in some angular cone, how is that distributed among the particles in the cone? Um, in a vacuum fragmentation process, there's sort of a very particular uh, distribution of um, of the fragments inside the jet that's driven by the, the PQCD vacuum physics. But we can ask, how is this modified uh, if the parton shower is developing inside the quark gluon plasma? Uh, or alternately, how is this modified if um, some of the energy that's being dumped from the jet into the medium, the medium is, 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 is responding to, has some back reaction to, and is filling in um, the cone with, with low energy thermal particles.
So uh, here's a, a summary of a measurement of this kind of fragmentation function. Uh, and what's being plotted here is this is the ratio of this distribution in the lead-lead collisions compared to that in the proton-proton collisions. Okay? So if you look at this, this, this ratio, uh, it's plotted here as a function of uh, a z, which is the, the ratio of the, the, the particle pt uh, in ratio to the total jet pt. You can see that this ratio is really quite different from unity. So there, there, there really are kinematic regions where um, there's, a, there's a significant enhancement or suppression. Um, and we, we think we understand the, the origin of these kinds of modifications. So on the low end, we see that uh, uh, jets that make it out of a quark gluon plasma have uh, a more, uh, sometimes many more, are composed of many more particles uh, at low energy. So we think of these are, as arising from uh, QGP-induced radiation of the quarks and gluons in the shower or of the response of the quark gluon plasma to energy being transferred into it. Um, we see a depletion kind of around here that we think of as arising from um, uh, changing how the fragmentation is proceeding. And then there's some controversy over what's happening at the very high PT there, which you can ask me about um, uh, in the questions if you like. And um, these are all well and good. But all of our measurements uh, through basically the LHC run one data, and I mean all of them, um, they are suffering from a fundamental ambiguity. And the fundamental ambiguity is this. If you see an event that looks like this, if you see an event where uh, there's one very visible jet that has some finite energy, and there is no matching jet on the other side, you don't know uh, what the what the PT, what the momentum of the jets would have been if there was no quark gluon plasma. So you don't know if this came from a parton-parton scattering configuration where, for example, um, this, this guy on top lost negligible amounts of energy and escaped intact, and this one had to barrel all the way through the QGP and so it lost almost everything. You, or if it's a somewhat different picture where actually uh, the jets were born uh, near the middle of the medium, and because of stochastic, uh, some stochastic component in the energy loss process, the idea that there are, there are big fluctuations jet by jet and how much energy is lost, um, it turned out that, that this one lost a lot, this one lost uh, somewhat less, and, uh, uh, and so lo and behold, that's what the event looks like. We don't know. And for uh, all of these measurements of how the uh, how the energy is distributed among the jet particles or other measurements of, of the structure of the jet, we have a similar ambiguity, which is that um, we can't tell if what we're seeing is how much of it is really arising from a change of the, of the QCD showering, or how much of it is basically <clears throat> excuse me, a selection bias uh, where experimentally uh, we're, 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 we're selecting the jets um, that still look identifiably uh, like jets. So this is the general problem. There's no handle on the initial kinematics before the quark gluon plasma effects. So this is where um, the, the photon jet processes come into play. So what I've been talking about so far are these, uh, these, these hard scattering processes um, where at leading order you, you get sort of one jet that's, that's back to back on either side. Um, these are relatively rare events, but ones we had uh, uh, lots of statistics for in, in what's called the run one uh, part of data taking at the LHC. And the, the, the challenge here is that, of course, both jets are, are, are losing energy. So we don't quite know what the kinematics would have been before the QGP. Um, with the higher statistics available to us in the LHC run two that ended uh, just uh, uh, in late 2018, um, we start to have appreciable statistics for events that look like this. Here is a hard scattering process, but instead of two jets coming out, um, uh, there's a high energy photon produced in one direction and balanced by a jet in the other. Okay? Now, photons, uh, they don't experience the strong nuclear interaction. So for the most part, the photons just pass through the QGP totally unaffected. 
And that gives us a major experimental benefit because then in, in a single process, we have a control, we have a photon which we know is unmodified, and we have a probe. We have the jet which is made up of strongly interacting particles uh, that does interact with the QGP. So, uh, I, I, um, so the question is, uh, 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 I assume what you're getting at is the plasma is electrically charged as well. Yeah. So um, the, the, the path length for the photon to undergo uh, any kind of appreciable interaction with the QGP is much bigger than the QGP volume. So except for very, very targeted precision things, we, we normally ignore that, that, that part of it. OK, so, so, so let me show you what some of these photon jet events look like. Um, here's an example of an event we recorded just under a year ago in 2018. Um, you can tell that this uh, here is a photon because the energy that it's deposited is in a very narrow region. And it's in the electromagnetic component of the calorimeter only, uh, whereas uh, uh, um, the, uh, the energy deposit up here is the jet. And what's nice about this is as soon as you see the photon, that immediately gives you information about what the kinematics were before the jet QGP interaction. It tells you approximately what the jet uh, um, a momentum and direction um, and even um, uh, whether it was a quark or a gluon, which I, uh, you can ask me about later. Uh, here's another example of an event where, uh, again, here is a, a high energy photon. You can tell because it's contained purely in a, in a, a localized region of the electromagnetic calorimeter. And then if you look on the other side of the detector, uh, there, there's really nothing there. So uh, this is an, another example of one of those extreme events where the jet really seems to have been almost completely thermalized um, uh, by the medium. So using the photon as uh, an external probe, you can imagine uh, starting, to, uh, uh, starting to, to break the, the jet quenching problem down into component pieces. Um, you can imagine a measurement of the photon tagged jet PT distributions or the photon jet PT balance and really learn about what is the absolute amount of energy that's transferred out of the cone. So not the relative difference of the energy transferred outside of one jet with respect to another, like in those previous measurements, but really an absolute scale. The absolute scale being set by the photon. Um, you can ask for the components of the, of the parton shower that remains pointing in the opposite direction, how is that modified? And then using the photon as an absolute external reference, you can go and decompose the rest of the event into angular and momentum modes and try to track down where the lost energy uh, has ended up. So I want to show you uh, two measurements that, that uh, are trying to address the first two questions here. Uh, so the first measurement is uh, a measurement of the photon plus jet PT balance. So what's reported in, the, in these kinds of measurements is the ratio of the PT of the jet to the PT of the photon, right? The ratio of the momenta in the transverse plane. Um, in vacuum, at leading order, one expects this ratio to be one. At leading order, the parton and the photon come out back to back, and they're exactly balanced. Um, and uh, so, so let's see what we see. Um, we, we start by first calibrating our photon jet measurements just in proton-proton collisions. The reason here is we, we want to understand the vacuum uh, or PP baseline. We want to test how well Monte Carlo generators or perturbative QCD calculations, uh, 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 how good are they at describing what we're seeing. Um, so the data is the same on, on uh, the, the plot on the left and the right here. Um, this, is a, this is the distribution of the XJ gamma, so the, the jet to photon PT ratio values. Um, you can see, as expected, it is peaked near unity, um, but, it, but, uh, um, but the distribution uh, has some tails down to lower values and to higher values. Basically, these are coming from the higher order perturbative diagrams where you get a, a photon and a jet, and then a second jet, either in the direction of the first one or in the direction of the photon. And so, and so one gets tails 
on either side of the distribution. But nevertheless, um, we, uh, uh, having an understanding of this in PP collisions, uh, we can make a measurement in the lead-lead collisions. And so I'll guide you through this panel by panel. So I'm going to show you several panels. And the data from the proton-proton collisions, so what the photon to jet balance looks like um, before any quark gluon plasma effects, that's going to be the same. That's going to be in blue on every panel. And uh, I can start by looking at this distribution in the lead-lead collisions, uh, which are very glancing, which look like this, where there's only a small amount of QGP created. You can see in that case, the um, jet to photon PT ratio looks very similar to that in PP collisions. But uh, I can do the trick I showed you earlier, where I start to select categories of events where the nuclei are systematically more and more overlapping. So uh, if I, if I um, uh, select events with a, a somewhat larger and hotter and longer lived QGP region, I see that the distribution in those events in red starts to change. The peak here starts to decrease. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a feature that appears in the very low end. So in general, the, the, the balance between the photon and the jet starts to be distorted. If I go to uh, even more uh, extreme selections where, where the nuclei basically have uh, almost complete overlap, I see a very big difference between the distribution. Um, but what's kind of interesting is that there really seems to be, there seems to be sort of a bimodal distribution where um, one can see there are a lot of events that have a jet to photon ratio that's very, very small. So those are some of the events we were seeing where there's a photon, but almost nothing identifiable on the other side. But there's still a localized peak here uh, uh, near unity, or at least where it is in the vacuum case. And so these must be coming from events um, where the amount of energy lost is uh, a very near zero or, or, or negligible compared to, to the overall total PT the jet would have had. And so those, for example, could be the events where the hard scattering happens near the surface, the jet escapes, the photon goes through the, the, through the, through the uh, full QGP region, but it doesn't care because it usually doesn't interact with it. So these events, so, so, so these kind of measurements, um, not only can they tell us about the absolute amount of, of, of energy loss inside the jet cone, but they can really tell us something about um, the role of um, uh, uh, the, the, the distributions of the energy lost in these events. Um, let me show you uh, one more measurement. We can also use photons to, uh, to select jets in an unbiased way uh, and, and, and measure um, some properties of how the energy is distributed within the jet. So these are photon tagged jet fragmentation functions. And, bef and as before, what I'm going to show you are distributions of the, uh, um, of the, uh, uh, of the variable z, which is the ratio of, of uh, the hadrons or the particles in the jet to, uh, to the total jet PT. So um, let me guide you a little bit through what, what you're seeing here, this kind of a busy plot. Um, so this is the, the, uh, the, the distribution of z values that's, that's there on the, on the x-axis. Um, and let me point you to um, the blue distribution you see on the top. This is what the fragmentation looks like um, for these jets that are opposite to uh, some high PT photon. And then what you see there in red, this is the distribution for what we call inclusively selected jets. So just all jets produced in any type of collision, no matter what else is happening. Um, and uh, I've not sort of focused on it in this talk, but actually, these jet populations uh, have, have an intrinsic difference. It happens that the, um, the diagrams that give you a photon in a jet in the final state, um, those jets are likely to have their parton shower started by a quark. Whereas for the inclusive jets, those jets are likely to have their parton shower started by a gluon. And it turns out um, that, that, that in the, the color factor of the very first particle that kicks off the shower um, really has an, some observable consequences for what the, the, the shape and the structure of the jet is and so forth. In fact, if I make the, the inclusive to the photon tagged ratio here, I, I see that it's not unity. Um, 
And I'll just say th those of you who are, um, who are familiar with, with, with the high energy physics aspect of this, um, the, the, the kind of differences we're seeing here are exactly what we expect, um, for example, from the differences we've observed in quark versus gluon jet fragmentation uh, even since the days of LEP. So it's kind of a nice internal consistency check on our analysis. Okay, so, uh, so we, can, we can measure, uh, again, how these fragmentation functions are modified in the, in the, uh, in the quark lump plasma. Um, one thing I want to bring to your attention is you, you notice the statistical uncertainties are, are, are much larger and are really visible in these plots. That's because these photon jet events are, are really rare. And it's only in the run two of the LHC that we've really had access to them. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we can see how, uh, uh, how these uh, look different for jets that have passed through a quark gluon plasma compared to the PP case. Um, the plot on the left shows you the ratio of the fragmentation functions where the QGP region is relatively small. The plot on the right is where the nuclei have almost full overlap, and so it's, so it's very big. Um, and we see that as we move from the left to the right, um, there really does seem to be a change uh, of, of what the fragmentation functions look like compared to the vacuum case. There really, the, the, the region here, which we characterize as the, the, the um, soft particles from the medium response or from induced radiation, the yield there is larger. This region where there's a softening of the fragmentation is larger as well. Uh, but the, the real interesting thing comes when we decided to compare our data to uh, the ratios I showed you earlier for the inclusively selected jets. So as done in, in almost every other measurement, uh, certainly in, in the run one data. Um, so if I put these red points on top of the photon tagged jet points, I can see that in this case on the left, the two are plausibly compatible within the uncertainties of the measurements. Um, but actually the two look quite differently on the right. In the events where the quark gluon plasma region is large, the jets that are opposite to a photon seem to be modified more and more. There's a lot more yield here. The softening extends to a, 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 over a much wider range. And it took us a little while to figure out why this should be, but we think it comes uh, uh, from an intrinsic limitation um, in the inclusive jet measurements. And here's what I mean. If what you're measuring is, is, uh, is uh, just jets as they emerge from the quark gluon plasma, uh, you almost assuredly have a survivor bias effect. Because if you, the way that we do the experiments is that we select jets within some given transverse momentum range. Um, but if a jet uh, were to experience a very large amount of energy loss or be really strongly attenuated by the quark gluon plasma, we wouldn't see it here. It would lose so much energy, it wouldn't look like a jet anymore. It, it, would, it would have fallen to a much smaller PT value. And so because of this kind of survivor bias, uh, anytime you, for example, select a jet that's going in this direction, you're, you're dominated by the ones that were born near the surface uh, of the quark gluon plasma, this kind of a heat map here. Um, and so this means uh, by, the, by, the, by the nature of how you've designed your experiment, you can't investigate the physics where the effects are the strongest. The, uh, the advantage of the photon tagged jet selection is you're selecting events on the basis of the photon. So you're, you're very democratically sampling all throughout the quark gluon plasma region. So you see the jets that are born not just near the surface, but also the ones that were born on the far end that have gone all the way through. And so it's only with, with, with this kind of photon tag that you can actually access jets that have a large path length that have been very strongly attenuated uh, by the quark gluon plasma. Um, I, just, I, I also want to say um, an important uh, aspect of the heavy ion field is uh, uh, the experiment theory interface. Um, it's a, I've not focused on it in this talk, but um, the data that I'm showing you here, um, with our increasing understanding of how to make measurements, we're, we're starting to produce data that are uh, fully corrected for all the detector resolution effects. And so they're sort of presented at a, at a detector-free final state particle level, which is quite difficult in the, in the heavy ion uh, data conditions, actually. Um, this means that uh, we can really hold um, the theorists' feet to the fire. We can really say, no, 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 
There's no additional you know, experimental effects here. This really is the result. Um, you can't hide behind uh, uh, um, uh, you know, any, any uh, um, uncorrected for effects in the data. Um, and so it's really enabling apples to apples comparisons <coughs> with the theory. OK, um, finally, let me say a few words about the future. Um, so we know that the LHC is going to continue to collide heavy ions at least through run uh, four. Um, many people in the heavy ion community, including myself, uh, got together and produced uh, um, a working report on what we think the opportunities are for uh, high density QCD, so for quark gluon plasma studies um, in the near future. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think there are, there are a lot of really nice opportunities given the expected luminosity that the collider can deliver. Um, here is a, a comparison of um, the ratio of the photon tagged jet fragmentation functions that I showed you in blue to the statistical precision we expect uh, at the end of run three of LHC running. So we think we'll be able to revisit a lot of the measurements we've done before and also qualitatively new ones. Um, we'll also have uh, substantial statistics, for example, for uh, Z tagged jet measurements. So a Z boson offers many of the advantages uh, 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 that a photon does, that it's not strongly interacting, um, but it has a few other experimental advantages as well, but the stats for it are very low. Um, finally, I'll say uh, I actually uh, joined this field, originally working on um, some of the detectors, uh, detectors at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, uh, Rick, at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, the, the, the jet program and using jets as probes of the quark gluon plasma has been uh, so <clears throat> successful in the community that actually uh, uh, people in the RIC community are planning to build an entirely new detector called S Phoenix, which is supposed to be uh, a general large aperture LHC style detector for dedicated jet physics, um, which will start to take data in the uh, early 2020s, in 2023, I think. Um, one of the nice things about RIC is that it collides, it can collide nuclei at a variety of energies, including at, uh, well, uh, 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 energies lower than at the LHC. Um, and so what this means is that the quark gluon plasma produced at RIC uh, is actually significantly closer to its uh, transition temperature. And so you, you may be able to, to uh, get additional physics leverage out of that. It also means um, these, these uh, uh, nuclear event backgrounds are smaller. And so one can measure uh, in an expanded uh, uh, kinematic range that's closer to the medium um, scales. Um, one just uh, um, in the context of talking about the, the photon jet measurements, um, the, the, the points you see in blue here, um, these are some of the, the photon jet PT balance uh, distributions that we see in PP collisions at the LHC. And I was describing to you why um, this, is, this distribution has some width and tails in both directions. Um, the analogous distribution at RIC, uh, you can see, is, is, is much sharper. And this is coming from the fact that um, at these lower energy collisions, um, the presence of these higher order diagrams where one has a photon and multiple jets is a lot smaller. So, so you really have a, a, a very tight initial correlation between uh, the photon and the jet. So this kind of physics is, is uh, uh, um, even more appealing at RIC energies. OK, so, uh, so let me uh, come all the way back to my original <coughs> motivation. So remember, the big picture here is we're trying to understand the quark gluon plasma behavior at multiple length scales. In particular, we're trying to understand how it is that the collective many body behavior on one extreme uh, manifests from the microscopic degrees of freedom that we, that we know have to be there from the other regime. We're trying to do this with these jet probes where the, the, where the, where the shower that eventually becomes the jet is probing the medium at scales all the way in between. Um, and I really think one of the fruitful ways that we have uh, to proceed now and in the near future at the LHC is with these photon jet probes, where you have on an event by event basis a self calibrating probe, where the photon is not affected by the QGP and the, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the jet is, and that gives you sort of a nice unbiased way to understand the parton quark gluon plasma interactions. <clears throat>
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Helen, working through the technical difficulties. Yeah. Any questions for Dennis? What's the energy at Rick? Uh, so, <clears throat> the top energy for heavy ion running at Rick is, is 200 GV center of mass. So 100 GV per nucleon per beam. But uh, in principle, um, uh, Rick can, can, can run all the way down. So people do like a, a beam energy scan where they try to run lower and lower and lower and lower and see if they can make the, the quark lone plasma formation turn off entirely. So there, there, there's, if you really have a dedicated uh, jet detector situated there, you can imagine a very versatile program of different collision species and different energies to get at that kind of physics. Yeah. How many Z jets are you going to have? <laughs> um, so um, uh, let's see. So I think in the, in the uh, 2018 data, which is our uh, largest Luminati data set so far, uh, we have um, something like maybe um, several thousands. The problem is that um, uh, uh, most Zs, because they're large mass, they're just they're born at rest. And if you really want to balance a jet off of a, off of a Z, uh, you, have, you have to select the, the, the much smaller fraction, which has some appreciable momentum in one direction or another. And so, um, so I think in the, in the 2018 data, we sort of have hundreds that have, uh, uh, f for where that's allowed. So um, I think um, there, there's been at least one sort of early measurement of the overall Z plus jet balance. Um, but it'll take us a few more years, I think, of really doing Z-tagged fragmentation functions and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Is there a, um, an, an equivalent of a plasma frequency? Yeah. I don't know the answer to your question. It's a good question. No. I, I calculated it during your talk. It's more GEV. Is what, sorry? It's more your GEV. Mm -hmm. I, I calculated it when you said that the photon comes out for free. So the yeah. order of magnitude of its order of GEV is a little too small to mess up your but there should be effects that Professor Craven said. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to have the photon probe them because the photon's so clean. Right, so, um, it, yes. Um, so I've been stressing that it's a clean probe. Maybe one thing that I'll, that I'll uh, put as a caveat is it's clean relative to the measurement of the jet. So it's, it's still a, a, a calorimetric measurement in a, you know, in a, in a dense environment. So I think it's still tough to, to get at sort of GV scale effects, but, but, but you could imagine, yeah.